Well, what does free man mean to me? Um, it means actually living it. Uh, kind of walking the walk or whatever you call it. Um, I got into the concept in sort of late 2008 because I, I got fed up of kind of going on protest marches in London and against the war in Iraq and Afghanistan and all the rest of it and nothing ever changing. So um, when I came across this free man thing, I, I didn't really believe it, but I thought it might be, a, if it checked out, it might be a good way of actually, you know, putting up some kind of rebellion or resistance against what's going on, you know. And having checked it out and found that the bulk of it did did check out with, with my own independent research, you know, I, I started sort of getting into it. Um, and then I got really, probably got bogged down in a lot of the detail, you know, of, of the law and statutes and, you know, internet research and reading loads of stuff. And And after about two years, I mean, I'd got free of a lot of things in my life physically and my, my old job and my house and lots of, you know, material things. But I, was, I wasn't really free because I was spending all my time, you know, researching free man and stuff. <laughs> so I think it's, in, it's important to have a balance. So, so free man to me is, is living as a free man. So however much you're into what you're doing, you've got to make sure you still have time to just be, you know. Um, me and my mate Simon, uh, sort of, who I only met at the the, uh, the ordinary festival the other week, we came across this phrase uh, "dooby dooby do," you know, which I quite like because you kind of do and then you be, and then you do and then you be. And I'm not sure who came up with that, but I like it. So uh, I found I was doing a lot, you know, all through my life I've been busy doing stuff, um, and f being a free man for me is is kind of becoming a lot more spiritual now, you know, um, and actually just being and having and making sure you take time just to be and not to do anything, not even read or listen to music, just sort of sit in, in nature and it's kind of like meditating a bit, you know, um, and when you do that and you open up your mind, you know, you get all this stuff comes to you and when your mind's busy and cluttered and full of stuff, you, that doesn't happen. So where I am right now, that's, that's been the biggest thing for me, is, is to realize that, you know, you don't need to do a lot of research because your little voice will tell you the answers, you know, if you, if you give it time and space to do that. So, yeah, it's about, about living it, living f free, you know, which is what I'm kind of doing now. So. The first guy who inspired me was a guy called Robert Arthur Menard in Canada. And he's made a lot of movies, which you can get on online, um, about how all this works. He was the first guy I think I came across who, who covered what's called a notice of understanding and intent and claim of right. So that's, that's what I use. I took, I took his sort of basis for that and then added my own stuff to it. Because I think that's important, you know, when you, if you're going to send a notice, you, first you need to make sure you understand all the terms uh, that are used in it, you know, and, and you may think they're in English, but um, there is a language called legalese. If you look up in the English dictionary the term legalese, you'll see it says they're the, the, the language that legal documents are written in. So it's actually a language, so it's like, it's like if you want to translate from English to legalese, you need a, a, a law dictionary, you need an English to, you know, you need a, a dictionary that's going to tell you what those terms mean, like if you want to learn French, you need a French dictionary to tell you what they what French words are. So, yeah, you, I mean, you need to. I sp I spent a lot of time researching the terms, you know, that are used in these notices and making sure I understood what they meant um, and 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 the context that they're used in. Um, but then it's important also. Everyone's situation is is a bit unique, so you need to. You need to change these sort of things to make sure they fit your situation, whatever it is. If you, you know, I gave notice about about tax and um, DV, DVLA road road taxes. It's called you know vehicle license duty um, and all the others. So um, claims of debt, you know, to credit card companies. So this notice of understanding, intent, and claim of right is that's that's pretty much what it is. It, you, you, you give notice that um, 
this is the situation as I understand it. Bum bum bum. And therefore I intend to do this. And I claim my right to do this under whatever, you know, aspect of the law or uh, natural law, moral law, common law, whatever it is, you know, that, that, you, that you're claiming it under. Um, and, you, and you give whoever you're sending it to a, a, a reasonable notice period in which to, to reply and tell them that if they don't reply in some way within that time that you, you'll take that to mean that they agree with you and then it's up to them to respond. The, the bit I also added into mine was I, I told them to, they had to write back to me, the, my human self, you know, not my legal fiction. And that was interesting because um, the, a lot of these government agencies and people, they can only write to your legal fiction because that's the entity that exists in the system. You don't exist in the system. So, but it's, it was quite interesting to get letters back from uh, HMRC and DVLA addressed to, you know, John of the Family Smith kind of thing, rather than Mr. John Smith. You know, so they will do it, but then they'll usually you usually find once they start talking about uh, your legal fiction, they'll head it up with your name again in capitals with the titles. So, <laughs> so they might address it to you to get you to open it, but then they'll always head it up, you know, relevant to your legal fiction. So you got to watch that. I had one like that from HMRC. So, um, but yeah, I mean. Draft it out, send it off, and see what happens. I got stopped by a cop called Phil one Sunday, and well, it's actually a line in a in a song I wrote about it called "No Tax for War," and you can get that on the on the website. But um, you know, this guy stopped me because he didn't see any tax on the on the car, and I went through the whole thing explaining um, about the war. And the fact that if you pay tax, you're actually breaking a statute law called the International Criminal Court Act 2000 and all of that stuff. You know, and this guy, um, having done his sort of bit, his job, um, he, he, just, he just sort of said, oh, good on you, mate, you know. He said, oh, he said, I'm sick of being a copper, to be honest. You know, he said, I got into this to solve crime and help people. And all I do is go around writing out tickets and, you know, chasing people for minor misdemeanors and, and sending in paperwork and stuff, you know, and he, and he was he was taking early retirement because he had enough, you know. Um, I met a few people like that, you know. Um, and you always meet, you always meet the sort of, there's this guy, Steve, from uh, the local authority who came about the council tax. And, uh, you know, he, this is a, a houseboat I used to have and he sort of c comes bounding down the, the gangplank, you know. Um, and I opened the door and said hello, and he, he didn't even say hello, you know, he said, are you the owner? You know, and I said no, because I wasn't legally. Um, well, you know, there's, there's the council tax is being, isn't being paid, who are the owners, you know? And you know, I said, oh, good morning, you know, you're going to say hello? But no, because they, they try and put this sort of, you know, they try and scare you, and you know, I'm the big authority figure, you know, and you're a little nobody kind of thing. You know, so you can, have, you can have some fun with that. I mean, all you got to do in that situation, like I did, is, is ask him for some ID and ask him for a phone to ring his office to, to verify he is who he says he is. He's representing who he says he is. And he, I mean, in this case, he didn't have a phone to give me. So, I mean, I'm not obliged to answer anything. If I can't prove who he is, I don't, I don't have to answer any of his questions. And so I didn't, you know, and he got really stroppy and frustrated, <laughs> you know, and he was really trying to intimidate me and, and uh, get me to give him information. And of course, I, I was under no obligation to. And, and then there's a guide, there's a guide on my website about how to deal with bailiffs as well. So you can, you can learn from a bit of mine and other people's experience. But it's the same, same thing when I had a bailiff come around, you know, they sort of, they march in and sort of, you know, intimidate you. And I mean, at the time I had this jetty and my houseboat here, and the guy came right down the jetty and onto the houseboat. And I said to him, well, if you want to talk to me, first thing you've got to do is, is uh, move behind this line here where my gate is, you know. I didn't actually have a gate, I just had a gate. 
gate post and get a frame. But I said, unless you stand near the side of that um, frame, you know, you, you'll be on private property and I'm, I'm not going to talk to you. So, so get, getting this big six foot four burly um, bailiff to eventually move back behind, <laughs> behind this gate, you know, before he spoke to him, it's, 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 you can have some fun with that, you know. And the first, the first time it happens, you know, you get a bit, you get a bit nervous because you've had all these years that you've been conditioned all your life to be scared of these sort of so-called authority figures, you know. But when you, when you realise that you have all the power and you have all the, the control in those situations and you take that back, you know, and you, and you make some move or whatever, you know, you, then you feel empowered and gives you confidence to do it another time, you know. And the next time you run into someone, you don't have that fear, you know, and you just, uh, and, it, and it, I find it's best to, to do it with a smile on your face, you know, and treat it for what it is, because it's just a load of bullshit. <laughs> you know, it's just a game, it's a big game, and you don't have to play it their way, you know. You can, uh, I mean, the, the rules of any game, I, I, I bet when we were kids we all had fun kind of trying to cheat the rules a little bit, you know, in Monopoly or something like that, you know. And some of the fun you have is getting caught or not getting caught, you know, trying to bend the rules a bit, you know, it's the same thing. Yeah. So just treat it like a game because that's all it is. It's not real, you know. The trees and the rivers and the mountains are real, not, not all this uh, legal system and everything else that goes with it. Yeah, so you've got about 2.2 .2 trillion pounds worth of so-called money in circulation, but um, you know the bulk of that isn't is an actual currency. About 50, 51, 52 billion of it. So 51 billion out of 2.2 .2 trillion. You know, it's a very tiny amount. Is sort of notes and coins in circulation, and all the rest is 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 credit. It's made, it's made up out of thin air. You know, it's uh, it's numbers on a screen. It's created by the bank when someone signs a document agreeing on behalf of their person, of course, to, to pay it back with interest. But they never create the money to pay the interest, so then the more has to be created, and that's got interest on, and, and so it goes on. I mean, if you want to really understand this, check out um, Money As Debt, which is a movie you can get online. Uh, Paul Grignon, I think his name is. Really good explanation of that whole thing. But, um, so, you know, the, the first thing to realise is money isn't real and it's not backed by anything, it has no tangible value. Um, and then when you look at the whole Eurozone thing and uh, the IMF and, and, and all of that, um, as far as I can see, what's, what's happened is, you know, uh, countries, if you, as they're called, you know, corporations called countries, have been sucked into this... Um, this sort of system of, of financial control. Um, and it's kind of, it's been the, the death of them really. I mean, I mean, look at ancient Greece. I mean, Greece has been around thousands of years happily sort of going along, minding its own business and, and you know, everyone's been okay as far as I, I'm aware. Um, you know, and in each, ancient times they gave us some of the best philosophy and all the rest of it. And within a few years, really, relatively, of going into the euro, now they're in a massive problem, you know, and you got, of course, you, once the IMF bail you out, you're, you're stuffed because then you're beholden to them and their debt um, regime. So, I mean, that to me, that's a whole, the whole euro thing is just a, a scam to get, to get countries um, indebted and beholden to that system. And then they'll start saying things like, you know, um, and they're already starting to say it. They're saying things like, you know, to stop this happening again, so this never happens again, you know, we need, uh, we need more centralised control. We need, a, we need a common monetary policy across the whole of Europe. So you, you're losing more control from separate areas to a central authority, you know. And, and that never works, you know, and, and ultimately, you know, it's on its way to one world government and one currency and, and all of that, and sort of new world order, you know. So I think they, they engineer these, these so-called crises, you know, to scare everyone. 
I don't personally think the, the thing will crash. They just want everyone to be scared that it will crash. Because if you're part of, if you're still part of that system and you, your mortgage and your house and everything depends on it, and your pension, you know, in, invested in the stock market and all of that, everyone's got a vested interest in it carrying on. If you think suddenly it's going to crash and you're going to lose your house and you're not going to have a pension and all the rest of it, you, you know, you get scared. So you keep your head down, you keep working, you know, and you keep paying your tax. And that's, that's keeps, you, keeps you under control. Well, there is, yeah. There's, there's ways of redemption through the free man process. Um, because basically these so-called debts, they're all, they're all created out of thin air. And, and the claim, the obligation, if you like, to repay them is with, is with your person, it's not with you as a, as a human. You know, it's with your legal entity, which is your capitalised, um, titled, usually capitalised, but titled uh, legal fiction, you know, which is your name created by the registration of your birth. So that's the entity that's obliged, that's got the deal, if you like. But all the contracts, all the contracts that support these so-called debts are all f not invalid under any kind of common law or any any kind of contract law because these contracts don't don't meet the criteria of a valid contract. So if you are, if you, if on behalf of your person you you send a notice to this whoever's claiming against you to um, to repay this thing, I mean this is what I found anyway. Um, if you ask them to prove the claim, they can't actually prove it. So then you, you know, what I did was say, well, um, if you can prove this claim, I'll repay whatever's owing on behalf of this entity, you know. But they never could, so I, so I didn't pay it back. So yeah, there's ways, there's ways of doing that. And the bizarre thing is, you know, to actually, to actually reduce the amount of debt overall, you've got to not pay. <laughs> Well, I say you, I mean, I can give advice to other people, but I found in my case that, um, you know, that if you look at the, if you look at how it all works, to reduce the amount of debt, you have to actually not pay it off. Because any money, any money you pay it off with is, is being created with interest, so you're just perpetuating the whole, the whole thing. But yeah, there's, there are, redem you know, and there are some templates. You can see how I did it on my website. You can see how others have done it on their websites. I mean, one that comes to mind off the top of the head was uh, DVLA, um, where, they, where the, the woman who wrote back said things like, uh, and the, these letters are all on my website, so you can read them. I haven't hidden anything. Um, she said things like, you know, you must, you must uh, obey, ab abide by statutory law, even though I'd already put in the notice why that didn't apply. Um, you know, and, and I will not discuss the matter any further, and then goes on to discuss it for like four more paragraphs. <laughs> I, had, I, I had to send three notices in the end to the DVLA. I sent my notice, and she, she wrote back saying, um, you know, quite a long letter, but just, there was just one line in this letter that said, <coughs> I interpret your notice to mean this, you know? And it was just lost in the, all the type, you know, I interpret your notice, blah, 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 blah. And you could easily just skip over that and, and get into what she, what she said, you know? But that's the important line was, I interpret your notice to mean. So if I, even though I'd already claimed what's called estoppel. So I'd sent a notice to the DVLA saying I'm going to deregister my car and this is why and this is why it works um, and if you don't agree if you don't reply I assume you agree. Um, they wrote back saying you know I had to abide by statutory law and they didn't answer any of the points I'd raised. So because they hadn't answered any of the points I raised I sent them an estoppel notice saying you haven't because you haven't answered any of the, the claims of right or anything. Um, or challenge any of my understandings, um, you haven't replied properly to the notice. So I claim estoppel. Then she's saying, I, I interpret your notice to mean, you know. So I've already claimed estoppel. I, you could think, well, I don't need to do anything now. 
But if the last, if the last bit of paper on file says, you know, we, we interpret your notice to mean and you haven't challenged it, that's, that's what goes down as being interpreted to mean. <laughs> so I had to reply to that and I went to every point she raised and told her why I thought she'd misinterpreted it and what I actually meant again and restated it and sent that back. So that's now the last bit of paper on file and I never heard back from them again. And they've, and they've never done, they've never sent any more things, you know, or, or any more um, claims or documents or anything about the, the road tax at all since then. I'm now living in my camper van in Europe and I travel, I travel around playing, you know, busking in markets or, or getting gigs in bars or, you know, this summer I've been playing in a campsite all summer, you know, sort of once a week and playing in a restaurant and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, and just living out in the country, in the mountains, by the river, you know, you, you <clears throat> I've got a dog now, you know, who's sort of met me on the road, so he travels with me and we, we hold up somewhere under a tree by a river, you know, and it's, you go to sleep and it's, it's pitch black, the stars are out, and all you can hear is the river running by, you know, and it's, it's beautiful, you know, and you and uh, it just opens you up to this reconnecting with nature thing, you know? And that's what it's all about. I mean, when, you know, walking without any shoes on and feeling the, the grass under your feet and, and swimming in the river and all, you know, it's, a, it's almost like the, the tree hugging thing, you know? <laughs> it's like go hug a tree, you know? It's actually a good thing to do. Um, obviously, if you're, if you're still heavily in the system, you haven't, you haven't really got a lot of time to do that. Cause because the one thing the system does is it is it takes your time away. Um, employment, you know, is a classic example. You know, and if you look up the term employment, one of the definitions is to keep busy and occupy someone or something, to employ them. It's to keep them busy and occupied so they haven't got time to do what they really should be doing, uh, which is all this other natural stuff, you know. So, I mean, if you... If you want to do that, you, you can, you know, there's, there's a road to go down, but you can get there. Um, so I'm, I'm very free of a lot of the other stuff, and I'm, I'm living in the van, and as I said, it's all a lot of nature, and, you know, still a lot of parties and things as well. Um, but I've, I've still got a, I'm still holding a passport on behalf of my legal fiction at the moment, which runs out in 2015. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, I can, I can choose when I want to represent this legal fiction or not, you know? It's up to me. So if I want to choose to represent it to reapply for a new passport in 2015, I, I don't see a problem with that. Um, and I know, I think Michael of Benicia has got a passport for his daughter now and she's not a, not a registered, she's not a registered birth, you know, but he's still got a passport for her. So people, th people tell you, you know, you, oh, you can do that, and you, but you can, you know? People told me if you don't pay tax, you'll get put in prison. But that's that's rubbish. If you if you if you understand the thing, and go through it the right way. That's not true, you know. So um, yeah, I mean, I think I've noticed in the last twelve months, because I was in I was in the south of France last last summer, work you know working. I mean, I don't call it work. I I call it going to play. You know, I'm going to, I'm going out to play. <laughs> Um, but I was, I had some gigs down there, but just in the 12 months up to this, this year, I've noticed a lot more people in vans and, you know, living, living out in the country and, and meeting up by rivers and having barbecues and just, and, and especially down the south of France, a lot of younger, younger people, they're not even bothering going into the system at all, you know, they're just... They're just getting an old van, they're getting a mattress in the back and a Cala gas stove and some tins and whatever and some veg and, and off they go and then, you know, they're living like that, you know, they're just not, not even getting into the whole thing so they've got to get out of it later. <laughs> and I think, you know, that's probably what we're going to see more and more over the next few generations is people, people who are in the, who are in the matrix, you know, waking up and realising they're in it and wanting to get out, more and more of that. But, but, you know, some of the new guys coming through, realising there's a matrix over there and I don't want to get plugged into it in the first place, you know, and bypass the whole thing. And I think there's a big divergence going on at the moment. 
and some people are getting more and more lost in the matrix, you know, and they, you know, getting the pizza and the, and putting the telly on, watching X Factor, you know, and, and worrying about the tax, and and then there's another load of people just saying that, you know, I've had enough of that, I'm not doing that anymore, and I want to get back to what I'm supposed to be doing, and I, they're going that way, and there's a big, big divergence going, that's what I see. Um, but I think it's really important to to get back. It's, we got to get our connection with the land back, you know? Because that's what we've lost since the Industrial Revolution and all that. We've lost that connection with the land, you know? I mean, prior to... Even prior to about... If you look at the stats, even prior to about 1850, 3% of people lived in cities. All the rest lived and worked the land and stuff. And by 1950 or whatever, it was 47%. You know, half of people living in cities. And everyone's crammed into these cities, you know. Um, so it feels really crowded, but it's not, it's not crowded, you know. The place isn't crowded. Britain isn't crowded, you know. It's, on average, there's an acre for everyone. That's, that's a lot. And they tell us the world's overpopulated. I mean, it's, that's not true either. You can fit everyone in the world. If you if you put four people, if you take groups of four and give them a quarter acre plot each, you can fit everyone in the world in Alaska. That was a stat I heard. I didn't quite believe it, but I went and checked the numbers out. So I looked at how big Alaska was and how many people and how many acres and all that, and it's, it's, it's about right. If you're still heavily locked into the system, it's something you need to go through, I feel, if you want to get free. You know, it's very hard. I don't think you can have a foot in two camps, you know. You can't kind of keep one foot in there with the house and the mortgage and, the, and, the, and all the taxes and the, all the paperwork stuff, you know, and then try and be free, you know, because you, you just can't do it. So I think if you want to... It's a kind of a cathartic thing, you know. If you want to liberate yourself, it's kind of a... It's, for me, it's a bit like the Shawshank Redemption, you know, when, if you've seen that movie, when Andy Dufresne crawls through 500 yards of the foulest smelling known to man, you know, to come out free on the other side, you know, that's, that's very symbolic of some of the things, you know, we have to do by sending notices to the government and all that kind of thing to get free of all that stuff, you know, that they try and bog us down with to stop us doing what we're here to do. So, yeah, I mean... The, it's, it's a tremendous, um, I'd, you know, I'd say to people, check it out yourself, do, do your own research, don't, don't just take things word of mouth or, or sort of third hand, you know, try and get back to the source information and check things out for yourself. But yeah, go through it, it's, there's some really good websites out there, some really good stuff, I've tried to put a lot of summaries of stuff on my website so people haven't got to wade through all the stuff I had to wade through, you know. And and um, people like Michael have done the same, you know, Michael Benicia. So and in different ways. So so there's some good stuff out there. But um, yeah, you don't need you don't need to um, kind of wade through it all now. I think there's a there's a few of us who've done quite a lot of groundwork. Hopefully to save some of the others as some of that hassle, you know. Well, obviously my own. <laughs> projectfreeman.com because uh, that's in sort of bite-sized chunks you can you can go through all the theory there and, ch and check out the research I've done to support it um, there's some the, the tpuc.org I think it is John Harris's website I used that early on for some of the constitutional stuff he's got a lot of good he's got copies of all the sort of constitutional stuff you need to look at like the Bill of Rights and the Magna Carta and all that stuff. There's um there's Michael's site, um, freetheplanet.net, which is great and that that goes in I mean he's gone into a lot more detail on stuff like mortgages and and trusts and some of the ways we can keep our our sort of valued things away from the system, you know, so that's good. I'd probably I'd say start start with um, you know have a look at some of John Harris's stuff, TPUC, um, and then have a look at 
have a look at some of my stuff for, for the summaries of things. There's a lot of definitions, you know, a, a definition of a legal term just on one slide on there. So you can just read what you need and you don't have to go through lots of reams and reams of paperwork. Um, and then, you know, have a look at freetheplanet.net as well. And that, and that goes into more of this, more of this alke alke alchemy stuff. You know, so yeah, it's a kind of gradual process, I guess. Depends where you are. You know, if you're if you're like I was a few years ago, you know, in a in a corporate job um, with a house and a and a family and a mortgage and all the rest of it, you know, it's you're kind of at step one, really. <laughs> um, and and to get yourself free of all that, you know, there's, there's quite a few things you have to go through. I guess most of the people who've who've got into this stuff have found that at some point you're going to run into some kind of confrontation with the system, you know. Um, so you know, I've I've had run-ins with uh, with uh, local authority tax inspectors. Uh, I've had run-ins with, you know, with with policemen stopping me for not having tax on my on my car, um, and uh, you know, with uh, bailiffs who were trying to, you know, claim alleged debt against my person and and those kind of things. Because um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm still not a free man. That's the thing. I mean, I'm free in a lot of ways, like physically, from the system and and the paperwork and all that stuff and the harassment. But you know, then you got all the internal stuff, you got all your you got all your sort of your ego and all that stuff, you know, and, and a lot of that. Your your attachments to you know, I, I love the Beatles and, and Man United and stuff like that and that's been all through my life when I was in the corporate world and and all that. And you know, and, and had a house and a mortgage and a, the whole thing and wore a suit. <laughs> And although that's a lot of that's gone, I mean, to be really free, you have to let go of everything, you know. And that's a lot. Of I wouldn't say I'm free yet. I'm free. I'm free physically in a lot of ways, you know. But like a lot of us, I'm still, uh, I'm still trying to, you know, reach nirvana. <laughs> so I'm getting into alchemy now, in, in studying alchemy and uh, and that kind of stuff. And I, I kind of don't want to. I probably don't want to spend too much time on the. The technicalities of the detail of the of the law and all that too much, you know, because then, as I say, you get you kind of that can be as much a distraction from your sort of life path as anything, you know. And I, for me, the for me the whole thing while we're here is to find out what we're here for, you know, find out what our, what our mission is, you know. We've all we've all come here with a mission. <laughs> And find out what it is and do it, you know, and don't let anything distract you too much. I mean, the, the free man thing for me is, is, has kind of helped me get free of a lot of distraction so that I can get on with doing what I'm here to do, which I think is, is kind of communication and sort of spreading the word through music, particularly talking as well, but music mainly. I think, you know, when I do my talks, it's, it's, it's cool and the slides are good and people get into it but when we sing a song you know it's when everyone really gets gets into it and it's great when they sing <laughs> when they sing the words back to you you know